Welcome back to Pocus Cases. In this episode, we're going to talk about pneumothorax pocus. Here's the case. A 60-year-old female is on her bike and ready to cross the street. When she crosses the street, she is struck by a car. She presents to the hospital and is complaining of left-sided chest pain. She has no past medical history, she's on no medications, and she's otherwise complaining of no other injuries other than her left-sided chest pain. When she's placed on the monitor, she's found to have a heart rate of 120, an oxygen saturation of 88% on room air, a rest rate of 22, and a blood pressure of 70 over 30. Now I know what many of you guys are saying. Isn't a chest x-ray good enough? I've done chest x-rays to rule out pneumothorax in the past, and I haven't had any problems. Let's take a look at this systematic review and meta-analysis that's done. One of the highest levels of research that can be done on a topic. It's showing that chest x-rays only have a sensitivity of 46%, where POCUS has a sensitivity of 88%. Both are very specific but POCUS has that advantage of being quite sensitive as well. So let's take a look at that supine trauma x-ray. Here's a great example. This x-ray has been read by our radiology team as showing no pneumothorax. However, on subsequent CT scan, you can show that this picture represents a large pneumothorax. You can see if you've learned to look for lung markings that go all the way out to the periphery, you'll see that lung markings pretty much do go all the way out to the periphery on the CT scan. When you shoot the x-ray beams through the lung, it's very hard to pick up the pneumothorax that's anterior in a lying down patient. Let me help you get started when you do your next POCUS for pneumothorax. I recommend using a linear probe. This high frequency probe will give you the best resolution. When you're looking for a pneumothorax, you don't need to look very deep into the patient's body. Thus, this high-frequency probe will allow you to generate the image that you need in order to determine if the patient has a pneumothorax or not. When you do the scan, you want to arrange it such that you have two ribs seen on the screen at a time. In order to do this, you're going to place the probe longitudinally on the patient with the marker 20, pointing towards the patient's head, and you're going to try to get two ribs on the screen one at one end of the probe and one at the other end of the probe such that in between the ribs you will see the lung. If you do this properly, you should obtain an image such as this. Let's go through the anatomy on this image. This area here is one of the ribs and this area here is the other rib. Anytime you have bone, ultrasound waves have a hard time penetrating through them and you're usually left with a shadow in the far field to the rib. In the more near field, you'll see the patient's subcutaneous tissue. Below that, you'll see the muscle. And in between the ribs, you have your intercostals. In the far field is where your lung is. In between your intercostals and your lung, you'll see a bright white line. This is the pleural line that we're looking for. If you're having trouble finding out which one of the white lines is your pleural line, it's usually the brightest white line that's on your screen. However, that may not always be the case. To help confirm your pleural line, once you've identified your ribs, the pleural line is naturally going to be just a few millimeters below that, sometimes up to a centimeter. Here again is that same image. Once again, you'll notice one of the brightest white lines on the screen is your pleural line. Just in the far field to your ribs, you will notice that that line is there. That is the area that we want to identify in order to look to see if there's lung sliding. If you see pleural sliding, that rules out pneumothorax. So here's your rib and the shadows that are created on each side. Here's another rib and here's your shadow. This bright white line represents the pleural line. And when I play this video, you'll see that that white line, when the patient breathes in and out, moves. 
This confirms that there's pleural sliding, and this rules out a pneumothorax at that area that you're looking. Comet tails are also very helpful. As a comet flies through the sky, you'll notice that behind the comet, you will see what appears to be the tail of the comet. Now, if we make this comet vertical, you will see that that tail tapers. This concept can be used to help you with lung ultrasound. Here is a picture of a lung ultrasound where we have a rib and a shadow, a rib and a shadow, and this bright white line just in the far field to the rib, which is our pleural line. Now, if you look right here, this is a comet tail arising from the pleural line. Comet tails will always arise from the pleural line and they will taper in the far field, usually only a few millimeters up to a centimeter below the pleural line. Now, if I can divert your attention right here, comet tails are helpful because if they're present, they rule out a pneumothorax. And as I play this video, you will see that there are comet tails that arise from that pleural line, and this rules out that there's a pneumothorax. In the case of a pneumothorax, you will have no lung sliding and no comet tails. So here's a rib and its shadow. Here's a rib and its shadow. In the middle, you see this bright white line just a few millimeters far field from that rib. And when I play the video, you'll see that that white line is not sliding and no comet tails are visible. This represents a pneumothorax. Confirming a pneumothorax requires finding the lung point. A lung point is an area where there is no sliding that meets an area where there is sliding. That's where the pneumothorax begins and normal lung ends. If you look right here on the screen, you will notice that there's a bright white line to the left of this line and a less bright li white line to the right of this line. Now keep your eye on this area because when I play the video, you're going to see that one side will be sliding and one side will not be sliding. This represents where the lung ends and the pneumothorax begins. So notice after I've played the video that there's a clear area on the screen that does slide and you can even notice some comet tails that appear from this line. This is normal lung sliding on this half of the screen. On this half of the screen, you'll notice that this line does not move. There's also no comet tails on this portion of the line. So there's a clear point where the lung ends and the pneumothorax begins. Once you find the lung point, that's pathognomonic for a pneumothorax. Let me help illustrate how we find the lung point. If you were to place a probe here on a patient's chest, you would be able to identify a pneumothorax. So when it's placed on this portion of the chest, you'll generate an image like this, and when I play the video, you'll see that this white line is not sliding. If I move the probe more laterally on the chest, I'm also still over the area of the pneumothorax. When I play this video, it will also illustrate that this pleural line is not moving. If I move the probe more posterior, I'm eventually going to find an area where there's lung. And in this area here, there's no pneumothorax. When I play this video, you'll see that not only is there lung sliding, but there's also comet tails. Now, if I place a probe right here, I'm going to have part of my image slide because there's normal lung and part of my image not slide because there's a pneumothorax. And when I play this video, you'll see the same. There's an area where there's lung sliding and an area where there's no sliding. This represents the lung point. A lot of people ask, well, now that I found out that there's a pneumothorax, how can I find out how big it is? Well, that all depends where the lung point is. If I have an image like this and I place the probe on the anterior portion of the patient's chest, I will find that there's no lung sliding. That helps me tell that there's a pneumothorax, but it does not tell me how big it is.
if I slide the probe more posterior from this line, I will eventually find the lung point. If the lung point is on the most anterior portion of the patient's chest, that is a very small pneumothorax. If the pneumothorax is bigger, I would see the lung point more on the lateral side of the patient's chest. And if the pneumothorax is very large, I would mainly only see the lung point on the more posterior portion of the patient's chest. So when you find the lung point, you can determine how big the pneumothorax is. So let's go back to our case where we had this 60-year-old female that was hit by a car. When we go to look for lung sliding, you'll see that on the anterior portion of the patient's chest, there's no lung sliding and no comet tails. This confirmed to us that this patient has a pneumothorax. We then moved the probe more and more laterally until we got more posterior on the patient. And when we did, we found out that the lung point was very posterior on the patient. This confirmed to us that there was a very large pneumothorax. In the setting of hypotension, we were quite concerned about this pneumothorax and felt it needed immediate attention. So back to our case, our patient's hypotensive. She has a lung point that we see in the more posterior portion of her chest. So a chest tube was put in after being needle decompressed and the patient's oxygen saturation and blood pressure improved. A few things that you need to be aware of when doing pneumothorax pocus. The first is there's some false positives. If a patient's had a previous pneumothorax and underwent a procedure called a pleurodesis, their visceral and parietal pleura will no longer slide upon each other and it, won't, and it will look like they have a pneumothorax when you scan them. So ask what their previous medical conditions are prior to doing the scan. Other medical conditions, such as COPD, mainly bullous emphysema, can also appear as a pneumothorax as there'll be no lung sliding where the bulli are. Also, there's some physiologic lung points that everybody has, mainly the cardiac lung point and the liver lung point. Let's illustrate what lung points that are physiologic look like. If I were to place the probe on a patient's chest right here, I would get those two ribs in view and I would look for lung sliding. If I were to slide the probe right here, there would be an area on my ultrasound screen where I'm seeing lung sliding because I'm still over a portion of the lung, but on the other side of my probe, I'm over the liver. This is how you find the liver lung point. This is what the liver lung point looks like. Here I've switched to the curvy linear probe just so I can look deeper into the chest. When I play this video, you're going to see that I got my rib in my shadow and my rib in my shadow in the near field. And there's a bright white line of millimeters far field from the rib shadows, and that lung is sliding. On this side of the screen, however, there's no lung sliding here. But in the far field, you can actually see the solid organ underneath. This is the liver. Right at this point is the liver lung point. This is where normal lung sliding ends and the solid organ begins. With the high frequency probe and my depth set at approximately five centimeters, you will see the same thing. Here's the rib in its shadow, and over here's a rib in its shadow, and there's this bright white line that's sliding back and forth. But on the far right side of the screen, you can see that there's a solid organ underneath it. This is the liver lung point. Now, if I go on the other side of the chest and place my probe right here, I would see lung sliding. But if I slide the probe to this area here, you'll see that half the side of my probe is on lung and half of it is over the heart. This would find the cardiac lung point. So once again, with the curvy linear probe, here's a rib in its shadow, here's a rib in its shadow, and you'll see at the top part of the screen, this bright white line is the pleural line sliding back and forth. And there's an area where it ends. Underneath that, you can see that there's a beating heart there. There's no pleura near field to it, but this is not a place where you'd ever want to needle decompress a chest. This is the cardiac lung point and that heart is underneath that area.
Now with the high frequency probe at that same area, you will see in this video that we have a ribbon of shadow, a ribbon of shadow, and this bright white line sliding back and forth. And on the right side of the screen, you're gonna see where the lung ends. And on this side, where there's no pleural line and no lung sliding, underneath it is a beating heart. The last caution is regarding chest tubes. As I'm sure you're aware, not all pneumothoraxes require chest tubes. Very small pneumothoraxes do not require chest tubes. Large pneumothoraxes, however, do. If you start using POCUS to determine if a patient has a pneumothorax, you're probably going to pick up more pneumothoraxes than x-rays do. Thus, be certain that the pneumothorax you pick up on ultrasound requires a chest tube. Find that lung point and find out how large the pneumothorax is. If the pneumothorax is large, it needs a chest tube. If the pneumothorax is tiny or small, it may not need a chest tube. Also things to consider is if you're going to be transferring patients or using mechanical intervention to ventilate a patient, you may require a chest tube in those cases. If you have any questions about whether your patient needs a chest tube or not, speak to your thoracic surgeon or your general surgeon to help you with those. So remember, supine chest x-rays are just not sensitive enough to rule out pneumothorax. This is where POCUS will be very helpful in these patients. POCUS can tell you the approximate size of the pneumothorax depending on where you see the lung point. And finally, be cautious. There are false positives and there are physiologic lung points that you need to be aware of. Here are some of the sources that I used to put together this talk. And as always, if there's any question, please email me at pocuscases at gmail.com. I strive to answer your questions in a very timely manner. Any questions at all, feel free to ask.